This is the story of the Ivory Queen of Soul, Tina Marie. My name is Kamisa and you're watching Urban TV On Demand. Lost people coming on strong. Mary Christine Brockett, known as Tina Marie, was born on March 5, 1956 in Santa Monica, California. She was the daughter of construction worker Thomas Leslie Brockett and home renovator Mary Ann. Tina spent her early childhood in Mission Hills, California. When she was eight years old, Tina Marie's parents began sending her on auditions and she was chosen for an acting role on the Beverly Hillbillies. If we should see Mr. Clampett, you know what to do. Did you hear that, Beverly? Isn't he a nice man? <laughs> but we love you. Just step inside. In the early 1970s, her family moved to Venice, Los Angeles, and Tina Marie would spend her teenage years in the historically black Venice neighborhood of Oakwood, nicknamed Venice Harlem. There she would meet a strong spiritual influence from the neighborhood named Bertha Lynn Jackson, a black woman and neighborhood matriarch who would become her godmother. By the time Tina Marie was a teenager, she had sung at the wedding of the son of comedy actor Jerry Lewis and had taught herself to play several instruments, including guitar, bass, and congas. She would create a band with her best friend Mickey Hearn and her brother Tony Brockett, and that was where Tina was discovered by Hal Davis. Hal, who was an accomplished writer and producer, would have the band audition for Motown's Barry Gordy, who then selected them to be in a film called The Innkeeper. Although the project would later end up being shelved, label boss Barry Gordy would be greatly impressed with her singing. At the time, however, he didn't have a need for another musical group, so he decided to sign her as a solo act. Tina would end up recording a lot of unreleased material with a number of different producers over the next few years before being spotted by her label mate, Rick James, who was immediately impressed with her sound as well. The two made an instant connection, and with backing from Rick James' Stone City Band, they put together Tina's debut album, Wild and Peaceful, which was released on Motown in 1979. Wild and Peaceful would enter the Billboard Soul Album chart, and the lead single, I'm a Sucker for Your Love, would appear on the Hot Soul Singles chart. The album would showcase Tina Marie's vocals and Rick James' writing and production skills. Her face was not visually on the album because Barry Gordy said people focused on the voice instead of the looks. Due to this, for years, people assumed Tina Marie was African American during the early months of her career until she performed on Soul Train with Rick James becoming the show's first white female guest. Her second album, Lady T, the name was actually given to her by Rick James, was released in the single Behind the Groove would reach number 21 on the R&B singles and years later would also be included on the soundtrack of Grand Theft Auto Vice City on the Fever 105 radio station. In 1982, Tina Marie got into a heated legal battle with Motown Records over her contract and disagreements about releasing her new material. The lawsuit would actually result in what today is called the Brocker Initiative, named after her last name. This made it illegal for a record company to keep an artist under contract without releasing new material for that artist. In those instances, artists are able to sign and release with another label instead of being held back by an unsupportive one. Tina Marie would comment on the law in an LA Times article saying, 
It wasn't something I set out to do. I just wanted to get away from Motown and have a good life. But it helped a lot of people like Luther Vandross and the Mary Jane Girls and a lot of different artists to be able to get out of their contracts. She would later leave Motown. Tina Marie went on to sign a worldwide deal with Columbia Records, which also established her own publishing company, Midnight Magic. In 1984, Tina Marie released her biggest selling album, Star Child, and her biggest hit, Lover Girl, peaked at number four on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 chart in March 1985, and at number nine on the R&B chart, Lover Girl would also be included in the 2002 Jennifer Lopez movie, Made in Manhattan. On June 9, 2009, she released Congo Square, which she described as personal and spiritual, and indicated that it was more jazz-influenced than most of her previous work. She did a duet with Faith Evans called Can't Last a Day. Tina Marie said that after she had recorded the song, she got the idea to put Faith on it. Also saying that she had always loved Faith in her vocal style. She went on to say that Faith reminded her of herself as far as Biggie and having a career with him and then without him, which reminded her of Rick James and herself. You know what I think is beautiful? And I was telling Faith a while back, the correlation of me and Rick and Faith and Biggie. This <laughs> seems very similar, like two different generations. They the next generation, but it's just the stories. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Just like I told you, I, I mean, not that I thought she, she signed you, but you know, even though the misconception of people thinking that I got a deal because of big. Right. I was right. doing songs for months. For right. Me too. I was in Motown before Rick was. <laughs> right. Tina Marie would tell Blues and Soul magazine that she wanted to do songs that reflected the things that she loved when she was growing up, saying every single song on the record is dedicated to someone or some musical giant that I loved. The pressure was dedicated to Rick James, then Baby I Love You and Ear Candy were dedicated to Marvin Gaye and Curtis Mayfield with memories of riding down Crenshaw in LA and in Jeeps and bumping to the music. Miss Coretta was dedicated to Miss Coretta Scott King, the late wife of Martin Luther King. Tina Marie would have a daughter who also sings named Aaliyah Rose, born Rose LaBeouf, who was born on Christmas in 1991. Most people would speculate that she was the daughter of Rick James, which turned out to be untrue. However, Tina Marie told a story of how she would also end up raising Rick James' son, Little Ricky, explaining that Rick James could not find a couple of his kids she would explain how his sister and her went looking for the kids and when they found them, Rick James looked at her and told her, I can't take both of them. And Tina Marie told him, I just met these kids. What are you talking about? Rick James said, listen, I can't take both of them, T. You got to take one. He said, I'll take the girl and you take the boy. And with that, Tina Marie raised his son. Sadly, on the afternoon of December 26, 2010, Tina Marie was found dead by her daughter, Alia Rose, in her Pasadena home. On December 30th, 2010, an autopsy was performed by the Los Angeles County Coroner, who found no signs of apparent trauma or a cause of death and concluded she had died from natural causes. She had suffered a generalized tonic-clonic seizure a month before. Tina Marie had also suffered a serious concussion in 2004 when while she was sleeping in a hotel room, a large picture frame fell and struck her on the head. The blow resulted in momentary seizures for the rest of her life. A memorial service was held for her on January 10th, 2011, and among those in attendance were Stevie Wonder, Denise Williams, Smokey Robinson, Queen Latifah, Lisa Ray, Sinbad, and Barry Gordy. Tina, tell us something. 
you do so many different kinds of music and your style is so variated and your expression is so authentic. What gives you this? What is what is it inside of you that makes you sing this? I hate to use the term, but you see so close related to a black experience when we hear you. I mean, and you're a white girl. I mean, where are you? Are you from? Have you lived amongst black people? Or are you from the ghetto? Or um, explain it. I, I grew up in, uh, in Venice. Were you poor? I wasn't poor, but, you know, there was like an area in Venice of about seven, eight blocks that it was like considered a ghetto. I didn't know it was a you know, ghetto when I was there, but that's what they say now. But um, it was just like a lot of fun. Like Venice is like, I feel like the melting pot of Los Angeles, you know. Like you can go there and just about find anything. It's far on the water, isn't it? Right. It must have been pretty. So it's definitely not a ghetto you're from. Um, yeah, there's, part of it is ghetto. Tina Marie's classic R&B soul and funk records have been widely sampled by hip-hop artists or covered by R&B divas. Tina Marie is regarded as something of a pioneer in helping to bring hip-hop to the mainstream by becoming one of the first artists of her time to rap one of her singles, Square Biz. In 1996, the Fugees paid tribute to her by interpolating the chorus of her hit, Ooh La La La, into its own Fuji La. The rap group The Firm would also pay tribute on their Firm Biz song. Recently, she was also credited as a songwriter on Beyonce's hit song Cuff It. Tina Marie is a four-time Grammy Award nominee and will always be known for her distinctive soprano vocals. Her success in R&B and soul music and loyalty to these genres have earned Tina Marie the title of Ivory Queen of Soul, and rightly so.